Any questions about last session, about introduction to convolutions? Um, can you please briefly talk about when to use padding on convolutions? Yeah, sure. So that's a great question, actually. What happens, for instance, to this three by three convolution when uh, your output point is somewhere near the boundary? What should be our boundary conditions? And let's say, uh, actually, you have multiple solutions to that problem. And I want you guys to actually improvise and try to answer it. Let's say this y, you are looking at y11. One, one. So it's going to be a point here, right at the boundary. We know the points to the right, the points below, but the points above and to the left of this point, they're going to be absent. There is no pixel. There is no input pixel. So these x's are just absent. What should we multiply by? And how can we take care of that? Any answers? OK. One answer is, I see on the chat, to just put a bunch of zeros. So whenever you don't have any x, assume it's 0. And that is called zero padding. You can assume the same value as the point next to it. That's also a correct answer on the chat. What else can you do? So now you are thinking in the regime. The other thing that you can do is just to uh, have this image and then reflect it above and to the left. That's called reflection padding. And sometimes for some applications, for instance, for medical images, and if you want to detect cancer or no, you can do that. You can do reflection. And we're going to see that when it comes to UNet architecture, when we do semantic segmentation. The other option is yes, you can put some averages here, replace X by some average. And maybe we can call that average padding. So now all of these answers are operating under the assumption that you want to preserve the same resolution, the same output resolution as your input. You want to have the same number of pixels. If you are willing to sacrifice some of the resolution and get slightly smaller, rather than starting with point one and one, with pixel one and one, you can start with pixel two and two. It means that the size of your Y is going to be a little bit smaller. You're going to have H prime and W prime that are slightly smaller. So that's another way. And these are all of the choices that you're you're going to be making when you are designing convolutional neural networks. Do you want to do zero padding? Do you want to do same padding? Do you want to do average padding? Do you want to do reflection padding? Do you want to make your image a little bit smaller from one layer to the next one? And these choices are usually your hyperparameters, the way that you think about them. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And I have another question. Um, so is one by one convolution basically the same with densely connected network? Uh, yes and no. If you look at every single pixel, then yes, it is just a fully connected uh, operation. And no, because uh, this W doesn't depend on the pixel that you're locating at. So you're doing that in parallel for every single pixel in your input image, you are multiplying it by the same matrix. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Okay. And one other point to mention here is, and why GPUs and TPUs and parallel processing is really helpful here. You can do this in sequence. You can look at pixel one and one, then you can pixel look at pixel one and two in your for loop, pixel one and three, then come back here, pixel two and one, in order, and this is what the CPU would do, would usually do, it's in sequence. You write two for loops, one on your I's, one on your J's, and then you would compute these. But something like a GPU is going to process all of these at once in parallel. And the reason why this is successful is because the outcome of this operation doesn't depend on the previous operation. I mean, doesn't depend on the previous pixel or the pixel to the left or right. So this output pixel, you can compute them in parallel. The same thing here. So you can have a parallel for loop on i and j. And these are very simple operations, matrix vector operations. They are very simple. OK, any other questions? Is everything clear? And the way that a convolutional neural network is going to work, these are convolution operations. 
is that you're gonna stack multiple of these operations on top of each other. You take your image, you push it through a perhaps three by three convolution, you apply your nonlinearity, ReLU, you take the outcome, you push it through another three by three convolution or five by five or 11 by 11 or seven by seven convolution. You go to the next layer, ReLU, and then you keep doing that. In between uh, every once in a while, you do some pooling operations to reduce the resolution. And in the end, you start with an image that is for instance, 224 by 224 by three. After all of these operations are done, you're gonna end up with another image or you can call it feature maps that has a size of seven by seven or five by five. And then C is going to be really long. It's going to be 2024. But in the end, you need a vector out of this because you want to do classification. What you're going to do is you're going to do a global average pooling, which is that you're averaging over your pixels. It's one over five times five. It's going to give you 25. It's going to be one over 25. The summation of all of these vectors element-wise, that's going to be the average of all of these vectors, it's gonna give you a single vector that has a size of 2048. Then you can take that, push it through your fully connected neural network, get your probabilities. As soon as you have your probabilities, you can do classification. Look at your likelihood and maximize it. Or look at the negative of the log of the likelihood and minimize that. There is a question about one by one convolution. Yes, unlike three by three convolutions that you need to think about padding, you don't need to think about padding when you have one by one convolution. Usually one by one convolutions are used to either reduce the number of channels or increase the number of channels. And no, the question is, is this W in the convolution the same as this W? No, they're not the same. If you want to be really careful with the notation of convolutional neural networks and neural networks, you're gonna soon get into trouble. You're gonna confuse yourself. There is gonna be a W for this particular layer, you're gonna add a lot of indices. So we are gonna use uh, these naming conventions, but you're gonna get the idea. It's just one convolution from one layer to the next one. That's gonna be a different W. This W is different from this W and so on. And again, this W here is for the width of your image and that's different from this W. So sometimes when you do convolutions, when you do neural networks, you have to be a little bit sloppy. With notation. The question is how is C prime determined? C prime is a hyperparameter that you choose. It's part of your alphas, it's part of your hyperparameters. And the way that it is determined is using your validation data. You look at your performance metric and you set C prime. There is a question, why do number of channels increase to 2000? It's actually what the number that I said was 2048. And that's again, your C prime it is something that you choose. It's your choice. But the way that you set it is using your validation data. Does that answer your question? Is the depth of the feature map, the number of kernels used? Exactly. So C prime is exactly the number of kernels. This is your kernel size, three by three, and C prime is the number of kernels. Any other questions? Okay, perfect.